Hey folks, welcome in to another edition of the Georgia Show, crossover edition here. Palmer Toms joined by Gators Online's Nick De La Torre, uh, ahead of Georgia, Florida, Florida, Georgia, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> I, I know in these parts, in, in, in the state of Georgia, in the city of Athens, it's uh, it's Georgia, Florida. Florida, Georgia is a band, uh, but mm. down in Gainesville, uh, where Nick's coming at us from, I, I feel sure that... Uh, Feel certain that, that there's going to be a differing opinion, right, Nick? Uh, it's just going alphabetical order, uh, is what Gainesville <laughs> people in Gainesville would say. F, F comes before G, so uh, you say Florida, Georgia. It's uh, growing up in South Florida, um, and then being in Gainesville for ten years. It's always weird to hear it called Georgia, Florida. I'm sure it, it's it's weird to hear uh, Florida, Georgia uh, for for Dog Nation. Hey, these these two schools can't agree on much. They can't agree no. on the name, can't agree on how many times they've played. Feels like there's there's got to be some simple things that they can agree on. What we can call it the world's largest outdoor cocktail party, and I mm-hmm. think everybody involved can agree with that. Um, <laughs> everyone, everyone outside of the Jacksonville City Council can agree <laughs> on that. Um, you know, certainly excited to see this game on Saturday, Nick. Um, you know, just I guess as we <clears throat> open things up here. Um, recording on Wednesday of of Florida week, uh, Georgia week. Um, you know what what has stood out to you uh, to to this point so far? Seven games in about Florida, about the season that B- Billy Napier has had in his first year in Gainesville. Um, well, a couple things. I mean, coming into the year, I joked that it, Anthony Richardson might be the answer to what if Cam Newton never stole a laptop. Um, and like in spurts, you see that. I mean, he's stiff armed a guy behind him during an 81 yard touchdown run against LSU last week. Uh, he played great against Utah in a win. He played great against Tennessee in, in his first road game um, as a starter in a loss. Um, and then you get games like USF and, and you get games like uh, he played against Missouri where he's just bad. Um, so the up and down from Anthony, I think has been surprising. Um, Florida's ability to get off the field in third down I think they would be the same if you and I were starters on, on the, on the defense. Um, I don't think we'd help much, but, but we couldn't make them any worse. They're literally the worst team in the entire country on getting off field on third down. And I thought, you know, after the Todd Grantham, which I'm sure Georgia fans are, are, are very familiar with after going through a couple of years of Todd Grantham's defense and third and Grantham, you thought, okay, well, it can't get any worse. And it, it actually has. So I think the biggest things have been, the up and down nature of Anthony Richardson because he has the potential to keep Florida in any game that he's on the field. Um, but he also looks like a guy who's started seven games um, at times. And then Florida's defense, um, they've played kind of bend but don't break, and 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 they've just been terrible, absolutely terrible on third down. Yeah, you know, I, I think Georgia fans for the most part, and, and I feel like college football fans for the most part, Caught Florida especially early on at the beginning of the season that that made marquee matchup against uh, Utah the the following week uh, the, against Kentucky the Tennessee game like you said um, and, and then there have been bits and pieces that fans have caught um, you know flipping over and and catching the end of that USF game um, because there's the it's almost like a bat signal Florida's in trouble Florida's in trouble uh, turn the game on. Um, the the Georgia fans have. So, um, you know, certainly feel like Georgia fans have caught bits and pieces of that emotional roller coaster. Like you said, the roller coaster that has been the 2022 season for Florida, Um, you know, coming out of the bye week, um, you know, what kind of, what have you heard coming out of the bye week about this Florida team? Some changes that maybe have been made, um, you know, just just overall, you know, where do you think this team is at coming into uh, this this marquee matchup against the number one team in the country? Well, I think Florida is going to be getting healthier. Uh, everyone will get healthy coming off of the bye week. Um, Osiris Torrance has not only been the best player on the offensive line or on the offense. He's probably been the best player on the team he was an AP all or midseason All-American. Um, which is funny because as we talk about recruiting and, and Florida's had a great week of recruiting, um, this is a three-star kid who had barely any offers and, you know, went to Louisiana and then transfers in for his senior year. And he's been great. He missed last week or two weeks ago against LSU. His backup, Richie Leonard, really had a good game against LSU. So you didn't really miss 
Osiris too much, but obviously if you're talking about a, an all American caliber player, getting him back should help Florida in the running game. Um, and, and that's really, I think where Florida needs to try to attack Georgia is running the ball, given how Anthony's been so inconsistent as a passer. Um, and then with a bye week, the Florida's given a, a bunch of young guys some chances. I think a, a move we might see made Wednesday night when the depth charts release is Kamari Wilson, who's a, a former five star, four star uh, safety from IMG Academy. Might be Georgia starting over. Certainly remember. Sure. Uh, might be starting over Trey Dean, who's also from the state of Georgia. Uh, Dean has struggled this year in his what seems like his 37th year at Florida. Um, he's a he's a grad senior. Um, he struggled. I think Kamari Wilson might get a chance to start over him. And then uh, back at defensive tackle, Desmond Watson, the, uh, you know, six foot five, 400 and change pound nose tackle uh, him and Jalen Lee, who was the starter to begin the year before losing it to Desmond. Uh, there might be some uh, a flip flop there back at the back of the defensive tackle, nose tackle position. So um, not too many changes for Florida, just getting healthier. And then, a couple of younger players uh, might get into the rotation more um, as they're, you know, eight weeks into the season. Now you're no longer a young player. You've, you've had a, a bunch of ex- experience and opportunity. Yeah. Kirby, like Kirby smart likes to say, um, you know, that, that this is the kind of time of year, especially for some of those guys that were spring enrollees that he kind of forgets that they're freshmen, that they mm-hmm. are sophomores in his eyes, because like you said, they've, they've played enough football, uh, to the point where, you know, th- th- they may have played more than some of the sophomores. Um, you know, if you're an impact freshman and you're playing right out of the gate, you may have played more than a, a sophomore who's-, who's still getting his footing, um, you know, a retro freshman of sorts. Um, you mentioned Anthony Richardson, and-, and obviously I feel like that's kind of the starting point of any conversation with Florida. Um, last year's game against Georgia was his first career start. Mm-hmm. Things didn't go great for him. Um, you know, turning the ball over, uh, Nolan Smith just had a, you know, feast, uh, feasted on Anthony Richardson, um, Nicobe Dean with the big play for Georgia as well. There, the pick six before the half. Um, and, and then you ended up seeing Emory Jones come back into that game. Um, <clears throat> what has, what has been the biggest tr- difference of Anthony Richardson from this year? Like you said, somebody that has, has, he's got a year under his belt now. Um, you know, obviously it's a new offense, it's a new system, um, but, you know, Kirby Smart has said, and, and maybe this is just him praising, um, you know, not wanting to give any uh, bulletin board material and, and respecting the work that Billy Napier has done, um, but he, he feels like he's seen a lot of development in Richardson um, as an overall player. Um, you know, we, we obviously there was a lot of hype around him after the, the opening weeks, first couple of weeks of the season. Uh, where have you seen Richardson grow the most? Well, first off, that that was a Dan Mullen setup. Uh, I mean, uh, Florida fans have been calling for Anthony Richardson to start. And, and based on what we've seen now, he probably wasn't ready to start. Um, but that was a setup. Dan Mullen just threw a freshman at the best <laughs> college defense ever assembled and looked at the fan base and said, hey, this is what you wanted? Uh, and I think there was a collective groan among the fan base, you know, heading into that week being like, no, this is not what we wanted. Play Emory. Let Emory go out and and fail against this defense who any quarterback is going to fail against. Um, and, and I think Anthony is – he's a really interesting kid to talk to because he's very introspective. And after games, even right after games, he will tell you, this is what I did wrong. This is what I was thinking. And, and, and that what he, be, what he was thinking might be, well, I was thinking about this and, and I wanted to throw better than Will Levis because there were 15 NFL scouts there. And you're like, Hey man, you can't think about that during the game. And he's like, yeah, I know, but then he'll do it again. You, you're, then you're reminded that he's a 20 year old kid, even though he is mm-hmm. mature and introspective in that you're reminded about that. So I think the, the emotional roller coaster that Florida fans have been on with Anthony, he's been on with them. And I think it's part of, um, just him maturing and growing as a person to not let those outside external factors impact him, uh, you know, while he's at the line or while he's in a huddle. Um, so I think the biggest thing for Anthony is just getting games under his belt, um, getting some experience. And I think he even admitted this week on Monday that he at times has been, um, you know, t- I guess shrunk in the moment a little bit or let the pressure get to him. Um, he said that you know, having played at Georgia last year or played against Georgia last year, 
was nervous, um, had the butterflies, same way for Utah, same way for Kentucky and USF, and that he's starting to, it's starting to just become normal for him now. Now, uh, George is a very good defense, not as good as last year. I don't don't know that you can be if you lose five starters in the first round of the NFL draft. Um, But I think he knows what to expect from this Georgia defense um, on Saturday. And, And he's at least played in this game and in this environment once. Yeah, and as you look at the rest of the Florida offense, um, it's really a tale of two stories. You know, top three rushing offense, bottom four passing offense. Um, You know, looking at the rest of the weapons that are there for the Gators offensively around Richardson, the guys that are going to have to help him if Florida is going to have a chance on Saturday – um, you know, who are a couple of those guys that stand out to me? Because just look to you, because just looking at it for me, um, you know, th- there are some big names that you recognize. Um, Trevor Etienne, obviously, with his brother's success, um, you know, just a freshman, he's had some success running the ball this season. Um, you know, Anthony Richardson as a rusher, uh, Montrell Johnson leading the team there. Um, and then as you flip over to the receivers, you know, there there are some names that are recognizable. Justin Shorter, Ricky Pearsall, uh, Xavier Henderson, you know, Pearsall being the transfer there. Mm-hmm. What, um, you know, what has stood out to you about the rest of this Florida offense? And and who do you think are going to have to be the guys that uh, th- that step up and help Richardson if, if Florida is going to have a chance on Saturday? Sure. Um, I, I said coming into the year, I've been covering Florida 10 years, and I said this is the worst wide receiver room I'd ever seen. Um, yeah, and Florida's had some bad wide receiver rooms. Um, you get a, a Pac-12 refugee in, in, in Ricky Pearsall, um, and he instantly became the best wide receiver in the room. Now, Justin Shorter has some bigger highlights. He has two 70-plus yard touchdown catches um, to start games. Granted, one was against Eastern Washington. Um, but had one last week against uh, L- or two weeks ago against LSU. So Florida's got like a one-two punch at receiver. Uh, Shorter's the X. He'll play outside. Pearsall's the the slot guy. Um, the tight ends they're trying to get involved more, but Dante is a uh, tight end turned defensive lineman returned tight end. So that can tell you kind of the skill set that's there um, and. And Keon Zipper, uh, just been an okay guy, uh, hasn't really met expectations. So there's really only a couple guys that are real big threats passing the ball. Um, the running game is where Florida needs to uh, make their bread this week. Uh, you've got the best offensive line Florida's had in, in seven, eight years. Um, you've got a quarterback who will make you play 11 on 11. Um, Trevor Etienne and, and Montrell um, Johnson have been – incredible this season um johnson just a just a sophomore a guy from louisiana who didn't really have any offers billy napier said we were surprised that we were able to get him at louisiana um and and i think you know ed o is probably kicking himself or anyone that was on the lsu staff that didn't extend an offer to this kid from new orleans uh it's probably kicking themselves because he's been uh one of florida's best running backs this year trevor Etienne comes in and uh, he's given me fits personally because every time I write Trevor, I'm like, wait, is it Travis or is it Trevor? And, <laughs> and I just kind of go back and forth. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure they would love to have Travis. Yeah, take both of them. Have, have both ETNs back there. Um, so Florida's really got um, – and, and there's two running backs that do, don't touch the ball very much right now, which are Lorenzo Lingard, who's a former five-star transfer from Miami, and Naquan Wright, who was the starter. And then the two younger guys kind of just took his job. Um, So there's four really talented running backs that can carry the ball five. If you include Richardson Um, and and Florida, to me, I came into the year thinking and saying pretty loudly, they would need to be 60, 40 run to pass. And I think if you look at it now, they're probably like 58%. I think they might need to be closer to 70, 30. Like, yeah, until you get (laughs) until so maybe it might be that will Muschamp game where, I think Florida threw six passes in Jacksonville and just rode Kelvin Taylor and Matt Jones to, you know, to a win. I don't know if you can run the ball like that on Georgia, but I think Florida should try. <laughs> We've seen what happens uh, when Anthony Richardson throws the ball or, or when they try to throw the ball significantly more than they run it. And it hasn't been a good outcome for Florida. Which is interesting because I think if you look at this Georgia defense, the the strength is is in that front seven. 
Um, you know, the, the passing defense has been strong, but it feels like at times they may have gotten, um, you know, lucky here and there, you know, just, just looking at some of the corners, um, you know, some of the plays that even at times, uh, you know, your star corner and Keely Ringo guy who's projected to be a first rounder uh, seems like he's getting beat at times. Um, you've got opposite of him, uh, Kamari Lassiter, who's a young guy uh, that, that's still getting his footing. You know, those guys have been called for pass interference penalties, um, you know, and given up yardage there. So it, it, I think if you look at this Georgia defense, where they may be a little bit susceptible is in the secondary um, so, you know, that's an interesting dynamic that's that's there because that's where Georgia may be susceptible, but it's not necessarily what Florida's strength is mm-hmm. offensively. Um, well, Florida, know, Florida did do that. So we thought they needed to run the ball against Tennessee and, and Florida identified, hey, there's a weakness in this in the Tennessee secondary. And they came out of the gate throwing the ball all over the field um, against the Volunteers. Yeah, and and it's not you know I think it, saying it would be a weakness for Georgia, um, you know they still come in as the number four passing defense in the country. They're still incredibly strong there, but I do think that if you're going to attack this Georgia defense, that like you said, isn't what it was last year. They are still very good, very mm-hmm. strong. I mean, number two, lo- looked up the stats today. They're number two in uh, in in scoring defense, number four in total defense, number four in rushing defense, number four in in passing defense to have top five units, uh, you know, statistically across the board uh, is is incredible considering what they did lose. Um, You know, they are still an incredibly talented unit. um, But I do think that if, if you're looking to try and, and uh, you know, beat them somewhere uh, you know, the, the, the secondary may be your better bet, which is certainly interesting as you, you know, look forward for Georgia having to play a Tennessee, having to play a Mississippi State, having to play in a, you know, likely NFL bound quarterback here, first round pick in, in Will Levis for Kentucky. Um, you know, it's it's certainly going to be an interesting test. Um, and, and, you know, Georgia is not going to be overlooking Florida, but some of these fans certainly are thinking ahead to, uh, you know, Tennessee, Mississippi State, Kentucky. Um, so going to be interested to see how the team comes out on Saturday um, with the those those big games looming, um, this is certainly the first of those big games. Um, as we transition over to Florida on defense and and this Georgia offense, you know, flipping the field here, um, you know, there, to me, just looking at Florida's defense, there's there's big names that you recognize. Um, you know, just just going down the you know list of of you know leaders on defense for tackles. You know, Rashad Torrance, somebody that you feel like you recognize. Ventrell Miller has been there for a while. Trey Dean, like you said, has been there for a while. Brenton Cox is somebody that obviously Georgia fans remember. Uh, Gervin Dexter, you know, the, the Shamar James is somebody that Georgia recruited. Um, you know, Kamari Wilson, like we mentioned earlier. As you look at that Florida defense, what is the strength of that defense? What is the weakness? And, and you know, where do you think that – Georgia might try to attack it. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, attacking it, you can take a knee on first down, take a knee on second down, um, and, and then you'll get another first down. Uh, that's just <laughs> attack Florida by getting to third down. Um, the Gators coming into the year, uh, I said Florida, like the the popular statement that fans always want to turn to is, oh, the cover, the cover was left bare. And when I looked at Florida's defensive line, I was like, the cupboard's not bare. You just don't have enough cups and plates to have like a 10 person dinner party. You've got really good front front line starters. And then after that, you just don't have a lot of depth or experience. Now going into week eight, you know, guys who didn't have that depth, a Jalen Lee, a Desmond Watson, um, you know, even Gervon Dexter didn't have a ton of experience. This would be his, you know, his really his first year as a full starter. Um, those guys now have that experience and you're starting to see, some rotation. I mean, the first game, Gervon Dexter and, and Brenton Cox played, I think, 68 and 62 snaps against Utah. Like th- that, that should be telling you, hey, we don't have anyone behind these guys. For a defensive tackle to play 68 snaps in a game, I think is wild. And Gervon Dexter is still, I think, in the top, not the top, you know, 10%, top 5% of most snaps played at his position. Um, but that's where you can kind of attack Florida and, and they've been good against the run. I think really good against the run because of their linebackers, Ventro Miller and Amari Bernie, great downhill, uh, get through a gap, 
you know, attack the quarterback, attack the running back. Great at that. Where Florida will be exposed on Saturday is with Georgia's tight ends. They're now. I'm not talking down on Florida. I don't know who is going to cover Brock Bowers other than the offensive coordinator not getting him the ball. That's probably the, the person who can cover Brock Bowers the best. But Florida simply doesn't have anyone to cover him. I said this uh, before the Utah game about Brant Keithy, and Brant Keithy went off against Florida. I was like, they just simply don't have a linebacker who is quick enough or a nickel who is big enough to cover Brant Keithy. And Brock Bowers is a bigger, better, faster, stronger Brant Keithy. Um, so that's where Florida is susceptible to being attacked. Um, I think the corners are really good. Um, they got Jaden Hill back. He had a pick six in his first, uh, in his first start back. Um, Jason Marshall has been solid. Um, it'll be interesting to see what shakeups, if any, there will be at safety. Um, but the biggest glaring, the biggest mismatch, mismatch I see is, is Brock Bowers and, and then also Washington as well. Um, but specifically Brock Bowers versus whoever Florida tries to cover him with. And and just looking at, you know, just a brief sample of Florida, um, like you said, that Utah game, they had trouble with the tight end. The Kentucky game as well, um, you know, felt like the tight end gave them yep. some hits. Um, you know, and, and and like you said, I don't know that there's many people in the country that are going to guard Brock Bowers uh, and and guard Darnell Washington. Um, it's, it's a one-two punch that I really think you're, you may be – especially without a healthy A.D. Mitchell, you're probably looking at the best two players on this offense um, and certainly the best player on this offense in Brock Bowers mm-hmm. uh, and, and maybe the second best player on this offense in Darnell Washington uh, when they're utilized well. Um, you know, it has felt at times like Georgia hasn't needed Brock Bowers and Darnell Washington, so they haven't gotten them the ball as much. Um, but, I, you know, I, I did, was kind of one of the things that I alluded to um you know, throughout the bye week is I think that George is going to use those tight ends a lot more mm-hmm. here, um, you know, post bye week. So um, certainly interested to see how that matchup plays out. Um, Nick, you know, it just just one thing that I think that is, is worth discussing here, and it's not specific to Saturday, um, you know, c- kind of gave you a heads up that I thought we were going to talk about it because it's something that gets talked about every year, uh, you know, with this game. What are your thoughts on uh, on on Jacksonville and and the home and home um, as we kind of wrap up this this Georgia Florida conversation? Yeah, it's um, I've been covering Florida for ten years. This is my tenth season. Um, I've been to every stadium um, at least once, except for Sanford Stadium, which uh, unless I get a new job, I'll never go to. <laughs> um, and, and Auburn. Um, this will actually be my. My second trip, Florida's third trip to AM since 2012. Um, I, I noticed Georgia has never played there. Wonder how the, the schedule gets made up, but that's a great place uh, to, to play a game. Um, I think personally, I would like a four year rotation of, let's say, Gainesville, Atlanta, Athens. Jacksonville. That way you get um, a game in a huge SEC hub in Atlanta, uh, a game in a, and, and there should be a ton of Georgia fans, I assume, in, in, in the city of Atlanta. Um, Jacksonville is a gigantic Gator alumni hub and the people of Jacksonville do not want the game to move from Jacksonville. They love it there. Um, the city of Jacksonville is going to have to continue ponying up if they want to keep it because I think Florida Kirby Smart's come out clearly and and said you know hey he wants to make this a home and home because he's had such a hard time recruiting um (laughs) with his classes um and and florida's about to put uh, is is finishing their research and is about to put hundreds of millions of dollars into a stadium renovation that stadium renovation will uh lower the capacity of the stadium while increasing ticket sale or ticket prices um, and you have to pay for that somehow. And that's not all going to be through booster money. You're going to need to sell some tickets. And, um, you know, the $1.5 million that Florida would get in 2023. Hey, would you make more for a sold out swamp with Georgia in town for the first time in, in, in since 1990? Um, you know, I, so me personally, I don't have a, a huge love or affinity for the game being held in Jacksonville. I get that there's a huge tradition, um, selfishly, I want to see a game between the hedges. Um, and I think it'd be really cool if, if you could 
come to the University of Florida, you come to the University of Georgia, you have the opportunity to play at, you know, the Mercedes Benz Dome or whatever the, they're calling it now in Atlanta. You get to play at TIA Bank. You get to play at home against the Gators or against Georgia. And, and you get to play in the swamp uh, against them. So to me, that's a great way to make everyone, except for the people in Jacksonville who want to have it there every year, a way to make everyone happy. Yeah, yeah, that that certainly is a proposal. And it's one that you've heard a lot of, um, you know, considering, you know, I think a lot of people look at the quote unquote neutral site that is Jacksonville significantly closer to Gainesville than it is Athens. Um, just like Atlanta would be a quote unquote neutral site significantly closer to Athens than it sure. is Gainesville. Um, you know, I personally, I, I, I don't love that idea. And maybe it's because Georgia seems to play a lot of games oh, at yeah. Mercedes Benz Stadium in Atlanta. Um, you know, whether that be a Chick fil A kickoff game like they did this year against, uh, against Oregon, they were scheduled to do that a couple years ago against Virginia. Before COVID, they're scheduled to do that a couple of years from now down the road against Clemson. Um, you know, obviously, if you're making the SEC championship game, you're playing there. Um, so personally, I don't feel the need to see more games for Georgia in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I do like Jacksonville. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, the the fan base enjoys traveling, you know, making that trip down, enjoying St. Simons, enjoying a trip to um, you know, the, the coast there. Um, so I don't mind Jacksonville for that. And, and, you know, quite frankly, I don't know that the, the, the problem that they have doesn't seem to be it's closer to Gainesville than it is Athens the, that with that being the neutral site problem, the problem that they seem to have with the neutral site is the recruiting aspect of it because it's 50, 50, um, mm. you know, you, you are still going to see, 50% Florida fans in Athens, in in, uh, in in Atlanta like you would in Jacksonville uh, and, and vice versa with Georgia fans. So I I think that if there was a way to find if, – if there was a way to do it where you had three sites in it and you had Jacksonville in there twice – uh, with with Athens and Gainesville in there once over a four year stretch, that would work as well. Um, but I also, you know, t- like you said, I wouldn't mind it going to a home and home. Um, you know, I don't have, um, you know, a, a, a ton of ties to Jacksonville. Um, you know, obviously, I'm I'm newer to covering this game, newer to this game than a lot of Georgia fans and Florida fans. Um, but you know, like like you said, selfishly. I would love to cover a game at the swamp. I would love to go to a game uh, there. And, and unless I find a new job, I don't <laughs> think that's going to happen. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly an interesting conversation. Like Kirby said uh, about it when asked about it last week, there's pros and cons to both sides. Um, you know, certainly interested to see what, what happens going forward with that, because I think that we've come to a point here uh, where that is going to happen. Uh, here before too long so yeah and it's um and, and th- this is not a, a reason to move the game at all but just an antidote for for fans it's an awful game for us like there's no tailgating for us <laughs> you know and the tailgating is probably the best part about it but then tia bank is is a closed press box um there's no noise from the field you know other than when the, the referee turns his mic on so we can hear calls um, but because the field is split 50 50, um, the, the stands are, it never gets loud enough, even when a, a big play is happening, for us to like experience that. Um, is, is so, Gainesville an open press box? Gainesville is an open press box, yeah. Okay, so, and so is Athens. So you, but you go to, you, so you go to the world's largest outdoor cocktail party and you buy all this exciting stuff. And then all we hear in the press box is just like keys clicking and like, and like <laughs> chatter. And, and, and it, it's an awful experience um to be in that press box for it uh especially when you know i'm in you know i'm going to some great stadiums lsu and all these other ones that that you get you know a real college environment for great experience for the fans to go if you've never been to a florida georgia game in jacksonville you should do it get there early stay the weekend make a whole weekend out of it um if you're a sports writer it uh it's not a fun, it's not a fun <laughs> game to watch in the press box yeah yeah um as we transition back to this weekend's game nick um, you know, I don't know what y'all do for predictions over on Gators Online. Um, we share ours on Friday afternoons. 
Um, you know, just just at, at least, you know, in terms of just initial thoughts, midweek thoughts on this game. Uh, you know, last I checked, Georgia was a it was like a 22 point favorite. Um and, 22 and a half. 22 and a half is, is where it's at now. Um, you know, unless you've unless you want to share a specific score, um, you know, do you what do you think about that that spread? What do you think about that uh, you know, the, the, this game uh as as we're you know a couple days away? I mean, that's a wild spread, but then I look at it and I'm like, yeah, no, and I mean that can happen. Um, 22 and a half for for a conference game for a rivalry. Um, you know, I think it's a lot. I, I go and I look and I'm like, well, they struggled a little bit against Kent State, and that Missouri game was tough. But then I look at it and I'm like, well, I, I watched Missouri, I watched them live. That's a really good front seven. They could give a bunch of people problems. Um, I, I don't think Florida, I don't think Georgia will cover the spread. I think Florida can keep it close. I've seen some crazy games in Jacksonville. I, I, will Muschamp literally was so bad against Georgia. Florida fans were calling him a Georgia plant. Um, I watched him, you know, pull a make-believe monkey off his back at his press conference when they were able to beat them. Now, I think Will Muschamp, nobody will enjoy beating Florida uh, more <laughs> than Kirby Smart, who played there and, and coaches there, and Will Muschamp, who played there and coaches there and was run off by the fan base. Um, nobody will enjoy that more. And I think Florida will have trouble getting what they want going on offense, given Will Muschamp on defense. And I think they'll figure out ways to kind of contain Anthony, make Anthony throw, make Florida one dimensional. I think Florida will try to run the ball to set up the pass. Um, but I think ultimately Georgia has too many guys. They, they've been ahead of Florida recruiting too many years for Florida to come out and get a win this game. I have no faith in Florida's. They've given, they've given no signs of life for reason to have faith that their defense will get better, or that their defense will make the necessary changes to not be the worst team in the country um, on third down. And, and like I said, there just isn't anybody on the roster that can cover Brock Bowers or Darnell Washington. Um, so if Georgia wants to try to get cute and throw some deep passes and do some stuff, cool, but you always have that safety net of they can't cover, <laughs> they can't cover our tight ends. So there, there is a, a safety valve and, you know, that's that safety net for you. Um, or if you want to make it your entire offense, you can have an entire day where Brock Bowers catches 25 passes for 300 yards and six touchdowns. But you don't think that Georgia will cover the spread? I don't. I, I think Georgia wins the game, and I think uh, – I don't, I don't think they cover the spread. So I would go – my picks would be Georgia, money line, Florida against the spread, and I'll go with the under. Over, under – set at 56 and a half is what i'm seeing there um, yeah which if you look at that under the over under and and the and the line vegas doesn't think florida's scoring much no like maybe no. 14 yeah yeah vegas vegas has florida for two touchdowns um and i'll tell you one thing that i've learned about gambling uh and the trip out to vegas the men and women that set betting lines don't build palaces out in the desert for being wrong very often. <laughs> yes, you are right on that one. Um, you are right indeed. Yeah, I, I'm I'm kind of with you. I mean, just looking at the history of this rivalry, um, you know, it's an emotional game. These teams tend to play up to the competition um, more so than they do down. Um, you know, Georgia's probably going to play well, but I think that you're going to see a, a motivated Florida team, mm -hmm. um, you know, behind Billy Napier in his first you know rivalry game here. Um, it, it's one that means a lot to both fan bases. It means a lot to these teams. Um, and, and it means a lot to, the, you know, especially Georgia's coaches, um, but also, you know, Napier having grown up, um, you know, not terribly far, not terribly too far removed from this game. Um, he understands what this game means. And so, yeah, I, I do think that that 22 and a half is probably a lot. Um, and, and and more often than not, you've seen closer games in this yeah. rivalry. Um, then you have blowouts. So I'm probably with you. Um, obviously, we'll have our official predictions here. Later this week on Dogs HQ, um, and and you said y'all do yours as well later this Friday. week. Friday, yep. So um, be sure to go check out Gators Online for their predictions on Friday. Dogs HQ for our predictions on Friday, um, and and the game Saturday. I'm certainly excited to see 
how things shake out. And uh, Nick, look forward to seeing you down there in Jacksonville. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Nick.